it's rather common to hear that a, a young girl might look up to her father, admire her father, and maybe even want to follow in her, his footsteps. It's a little bit more uncommon for an eight-year-old girl to be separated from her father for two years, except for brief visits, and then in the year of 1974, to move with her six siblings and her mom to the city of Saigon, Vietnam. Now, 1974, if you recall your history, the, the Vietnam War was actually over. And the US government wanted everything to be OK. And they deemed Saigon safe for families to move there. Well, it turned out the following year, everybody found out that it really wasn't safe. But at that time, in the summer of 1974, I was so excited to go with my family to live with my father in Saigon. Little did I know, though, because we had lived in Taiwan, where we had a big house, a huge, sprawling yard. You could almost not see the end of it, the run of the neighborhood. We could go hither and yon all by ourselves, not worry about a thing. Well, when we arrived in Saigon, we got in our car and we drove through the city streets, tiny city streets, and then we went into this tiny little alley that was to become our home, walked through tall gates made of steel that shut behind us with a clang and were topped with sharp, pokey spires at the top. Our front yard was about as big as a postage stamp, filled not with grass, but little tiny rocks. We did learn to play kickball there somehow, but kids are pretty inventive. When we walked inside the front house, I noticed that there was no glass in the windows. It was wrinkly plastic. And I said to my brother, I was like, what's that about? And he said, well, bombs. In case they explode, the glass won't. Oh, I said. Well, my dad worked for the government. He worked for the CIA. He was in psychological warfare, which sounds so intense and so crazy. But he was actually a very mild-mannered man, very slight. had. Um, dark glasses or black room glasses and was loved by the people he worked with and he loved them. He worked actually at a radio station which broadcast gray radio which means that he was broadcasting into North Vietnam trying to convince them to lay down their arms and come back to Mother Vietnam. That was the name of the main program and it was this beautiful Vietnamese woman with a sonorous voice that talked to the soldiers at night and said, aren't you tired? Wouldn't you like to come back to Mother Vietnam? Lay down your arms. And then they'd play this really nice music. And there was no way to tell if this was, was successful or not, because usually they didn't come running across the board and be like, hey, I just heard a radio <laughs> program. I'd like to get, my, get in. But they did have a successful venture there in the sense that it was actually like a family. It was so different than what Vietnam was all about, but my dad had this little group of people that loved him and he loved them and they, they made this amazing program work in the confines of <laughs> what, what could work at that time. So there, he was, there we were, we arrived in Vietnam, we were with my dad and I hadn't seen him very much in two years and I was so excited. But the hustle and the bustle of getting everything together and moving in and learning how to live together as a family again. And I had six siblings, and I was the quiet, small one that was kind of always in the background trying to, I was sort of the middle child, trying to make things work out and not be too much of a bother. So it happened we had a welcome home, or a, a housewarming party, and more hustle and bustle. And actually, I was so excited because there was a fort or a little fort put up in our front yard. I thought, oh my gosh, a dollhouse, a tree house, I can play in there until the soldier with the M16 showed up so that he could guard all these special people who are coming to stay at our house. Well, they all arrived, about 100 people. I sat again in the background and watched everything going on and um, was fascinated by the silverware and the china and the pretty dresses and the sound of music. And, my father was a radio station, and they did have the South Vietnamese, one of the best bands there, the Vietnamese Beatles. <laughs> um, so pretty soon they were playing up on our big rooftop that had the huge army parachute over it, and the generals were there, and the majors, and the colonels, and the captains, and my brothers and sisters, and the beautiful DJs, and I was there in the background and watching all of this and, and um, just enjoying it and a little tentative and not really sure what to do and kind of wishing Maybe I could see my dad a little bit after all this time. Well, he 
picked me out in the crowd as the band was playing, and he pulled me from within all these other people, and he pulled me up to dance with him. Well, again, I was a little girl. I didn't know how to dance. <laughs> and as we moved around on the dance floor like this and like that, he saw that I wasn't going to be able to keep up with him or with the other dancers. And so he said to me, put your feet onto my feet. And so my little eight-year-old feet went on to his feet. My CIA operative father, who was in charge of all these people, and all these people were there because they loved him and he loved them. And he said, put your feet onto my feet. And I did. And I still remember the feeling of his, the leather of his shoes holding me up and how firm that was and how little my feet were. And then we began to twirl around the dance floor. And so finally there I was, waltzing around the dance floor with my father, following him. Thank you. <laughs>